Welcome again, guys, to another Protein Bros podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Wasserman. And sadly, we do not have our co-host with us this week, Kyle Combs. So we're doing something new this week. I'm a solo bro this week, but I did have three bodybuilders in the house, three IFBB pros, Jeremy Potvin, Anas Muhammad, and Steve Raylos. Uh, Jeremy is actually competing in this year's Olympia for his fifth time. Um, he's finished as high as third and has had multiple top five finishes uh, in the men's physique category. We talk about the subjectivity of the sport and how difficult it is to uh, have strong mental health whenever judges are telling you that you don't look good enough. We talk about the new weight classes they just started implementing and if those things are actually beneficial or is it just beneficial for a certain few. We talk about steroid use and how social media has had this trend really, really explode with young people looking into taking things that enhances their bodies and uh, whether or not that they think that's healthy and how do we mitigate that. We talk about Jeremy Potvin's ascent in the sport and how he became one of the top physique guys at each Olympia and doing so at a much lighter weight uh, than people are used to seeing on stage. And lastly, one of the hardest things to do about the sport is the comparison game. What it's like, you know, being a fan of the sport and seeing others that you look up to standing on stage with you and maybe having a physique that you think looks better than yours. It's a really interesting topic. I will hope you guys lean into this one. Um, if you've ever, ever been interested in bodybuilding, this is the episode for you. Uh, we hope you guys tune in and enjoy. And as always, let us know what you guys think in the comments and please share up the podcast. Now let's get into it. So I'm sitting here with three FEB Pro bodybuilders. Pretty cool. Uh, my, I'm a highly secure man, so this is easy, you know. Um, I've been around some unbelievably in shape people over my life, but I don't know if I've ever sat in the same room as three IPB Pros at the same time. Let's go. Pretty cool. How about you guys? Just kidding. <laughs> yeah, you know, last pro show, how many competitors were in it? Good question. How many competitors did you compete with in your last show? 32-ish. Is that in your class? Wow, man. Mine was about 20, I would say, 2025. Yeah? When was your last show in us? That was back in 2019. Okay. <clears throat> man, oh, man. Steve, when you got your pro card, how many people were in your class? Uh, 16. Damn. Shout out to right. Nas. Way to coach him up. <laughs> All right. He did the hard work. Hey, man, hey. <laughs> but now, on to the, Steve, we got to talk about this because you're, so we got Jeremy who's competing in the Olympia here in four weeks. Yes, sir. And we've got Steve, who is wanting to compete in the Olympia, or compete in the Olympia. Was it by what year? 2025. 2025 Masters, Masters Olympia. Crazy. So what's cool is, it's just the parallels of the journeys, because this is going to be your fifth Olympia. Is that correct? Yep. Jeremy's fifth Olympia. You're going for your first. First question I have for you is, is this. You, you did your first Olympia 2016, if I get that correct. That is correct. And you took third in the Olympia. Crazy. Uh, that was... Was that the year, who won first that year? So that was Jeremy Buendia's, I want to say his uh, third or. And it was like Raymond, Ray so, Edmonds? Well, no, so was he Jeremy second? got first, okay. Ryan Terry got second, and then I got third. Um, fourth, I want to say, was maybe Brandon Anderson. Okay. So. And he's, in it, he's won in one, hasn't he? He's got three. Now he's got three. Yeah, he's got three, I believe. Mm -hmm. Dear God. So. <laughs> Some serious competition that year. Unreal. And in that, being your first, what is, is here's my, like, there's so many questions about this, but specifically, your first time doing it, what a rush, right? Oh, yeah. What was the difference on this second or third? Is it everything go back to, like, how crazy the, the glitz and glam of the moment of the first one? Or they have their own individual experiences? Everyone's been different. Uh, that first one, I went in with no expectations, just to have fun, enjoy the experience, you know, see how I stack up on the biggest stage of bodybuilding. And um, that was, I mean, amazing. Obviously, I had my family yeah. there, and I got emotional. The second one was... Just kind of a make it moment, right? Yeah. I mean, like, fully. I mean, because you're there, and you start seeing people uh, when you get off stage, and they're all congratulating you and stuff like that. It's pretty awesome. But uh, the second one which I believe is that picture right there on the bottom. That was the second one. And that one to me was one where I felt the most pressure because I had just placed third. Um, and I felt like I, I don't know, I had to do something to kind of make my way up. Didn't quite end up the way I wanted it to, but I was still in the top five. So, yeah. How do you, how do you come back from that where you put these expectations on yourself 
everybody always wants to do better than they did in their last show. And, you have, and in, everybody at this table has a moment where they had, you know, they didn't hit up the expectation that they had for themselves. Did you come back the very next year? Or did uh, you take some time? For 2018, I did. Yeah. But I did end up taking all of 2017 basically off. So back when I was, when I placed uh, third and fifth, I believe it was the top five are automatically requalified. Right. So I got lucky in that I didn't have to try to requalify in 2018. And uh, 2018, I did that Olympia and I ended up in 10th. So it was kind of like, damn. In, in like, and I would say that how much of that had to do with your own personal journey there versus the uh, evolution of the physique class for, for, for bodybuilding? I think, because honestly, when I look back at 2018, that was one of my favorite looks, but it was also one of the worst placings I received. I thought me and my coach at the time, we had nailed everything. We were perfect. We were how... And for we our listeners, I'm so sorry to interrupt yeah, you. Yeah. What's 2018, that look, what did that look look different from the third place 2016? I think it was just, uh, you know, it was a little bit bigger. You know, I mean, for people who don't know me, I'm... I'm a small guy, you know, I'm five, five. I compete at in 2016 when I got third, I was about 150. So, I mean, I don't think I broke 150 until 2018. I was probably 153. Yeah. And then now I'm 160 stage weight. Um, but yeah, the, I think the difference in the look was just like the hardness. Um, now, are we allowed to be completely open here? Hundred percent. I ran more stuff, yeah, uh, more than normal, and I think you know I felt like crap, but it did help me look a little bit fuller and better. This is that year right here. Yeah, that was that year, twenty eighteen. Yeah, and so you know you have about five, six more pounds on you as far as on stage. Yeah, a couple pounds. Um, what is that, Kyle? This is actually. A Kyle move. <laughs> Kyle will turn everything on Do Not Disturb, but he has somehow alarm set to go off during the pot. This actually yeah. happens real life. Anyways, all good. S- Steve, this, for thank this. Thank you, Kyle. <laughs> for, this for, is what happens. For this, you're going to do one hour cardio. <laughs> yeah. What was neat, What was so important that there was alarm set for 6 p.m.? So that is actually the 9 a.m. Australia time call from my mom, which has been postponed because I knew I was doing this, but inadvertently forgot to turn the alarm off. My gosh, if so there was ever a thing we can't be mad at. Yeah. yeah, you can't. So Man, what, a, there, what an excuse. Right? <laughs> Can you beat that? Now we're a dick for making fun of you. <laughs> Pretty Sorry much. about that. If you need to set the alarm again, we get it. Let it Ten go minutes off. then. Let it go off at will at this point. I'm sorry. Okay. You were saying 2018, we're running, I said it was about five, six more pounds. Is that right? Uh, like three or four. But again, with somebody as small as me, I guess, it's a lot. So yeah. three or four pounds goes a long way. Like I said, I mean, I've only gone 10 pounds since 2016, but that 10 pounds is quite a it goes, significant look. No doubt. It's been, I mean, uh, for everybody listening at home, it's a huge deal, especially you, you can't get any taller. Yeah. When you get, when you, <laughs> I mean, we still don't know what kind of gear helps with that, yeah. but bottom line is you can't get any taller. And so if you're going to add more size, it's going to look completely different uh, when you add that kind of weight, especially when it's going to be just pure muscle here. Yeah. Um, so, Let's talk a little bit about that because um, we're seeing the sport. Obviously, we've seen some people who've been pushing the pushing um, anabolics, and it hasn't worked out well. We've had people lose their lives at a much at a much younger age, and I'm loving that I'm seeing the sport. I feel like swing where it should back to where it's like, hey, let's not so much pressure to run these ridiculous you know levels. Mm-hmm. Um, is, do you feel less pressure nowadays when it comes to that? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, my last show prep. A lot of people would probably call bullshit on what I was running. Sure. Because I was running 300 test, uh, 300 mass run, and 300 trying a week, and that was it. Mm-hmm. Um, on, uh, of course, my orals as well, but still, for those doses to be that low for the week, usually you're talking to people who are running five, 700 up to a gram. And, um, yeah, since I – after that 2018 prep, I kind of told myself I'm not going to – do that. <laughs> I'm not going to mm-hmm. run that much stuff. I had felt like I was running out of places to pin. <laughs> sure. You know? Um, so it, it was just something that I didn't want to do. Granted, I brought a great look. I just didn't feel like the risk to reward was worth it. I'm with you. So these, uh, like you were saying, especially, you know, you, you put all this energy and effort into it. You guys, 
you get into these spots and I'm talking to all of three of you here now where it's like you get on stage and if you ever had one where it just went completely different than what you thought, where it's just like it, like what you thought you looked like versus what the judges thought was just like a 10 place difference or something like, where's the threshold, right? Like what's the number where it's like, I can't even like, the, I don't even want to be here. You yeah. know, who, I'm, I'm not even coming back for the night show <laughs> type of situation. Has anybody not come back for the night show? Always made it back. Always show up. Okay. Yeah. Always, show up Always no got it. There's a, yeah, I was going to say, there's a special, that's a special group where it's like, man, are you that hard? Like, man, how much do you got to grow up to just totally not come back to the night show? I mean, even uh, when I did Team Universe, trying to get my pro card, this is my second national show. I got third call out to that one. And I, I went back for the night show, but in between that, I mean, I went and enjoyed myself. I had all yeah. sorts of food, took a shower. <laughs> You know, did all that stuff. Everybody's looking at me like, damn, what would you do? And I'm just <laughs> shower. You know, I'm walking across the stage for yeah. like one second and that's it. So everybody, like, you, <laughs> you're backstage and everybody's asking these questions. Like, come on, man. What yeah, do you they're think? like, why don't you stink? <laughs> yeah. I, I think uh, I think that's more of a case when you first start out. So um, going back to my first couple shows, I mean, I was clueless. I mean, I thought I was bringing some grade A look and I look back at photos and it's a real reality check. Yeah. And it's actually the second show I ever did was when I met an ass and I can only Nina and I, we, we laugh about what, what he must've been thinking, like laughing in the back corner, like who the freak does this guy think he is sort of deal. And, and, um, but you know, uh, looking back on it, you know, actually going to that show, I would never have met him and, and, you know, he, he would never, he never reached out and, would never have reached out and said, Hey, you know, if, if you want help with this, um, you know, let's do it. And, and, you know, so I'm thankful for that. So that bad look actually put me in connection with him. So <laughs> that's, I mean, Hey, blessing in disguise, right? Right. Ah, now you got your pro card. And yeah. Now he's batting a thousand. So all the pressure's on him. <laughs> <over> me. <laughs> you guys, <clears throat> everybody here, you know, has, you know, the, the, the brotherhood of, these grueling, um, you know, all the conditioning that goes into you guys stepping on stage. What was your most grueling prep you've ever done to the state? Mine are consistently getting harder and harder. Um, it's a combination of, you know, obviously you're getting old, older. You can't do the same things you used to do when you were younger. Can't eat the same way or get away with half that stuff. So I've, I felt like I destroyed my, uh, internal health kind of doing the yo-yo dieting you know, going from one extreme to another um so every prep i do now it's it's a new challenge how so, many weeks is this one gonna be uh well i had a, a couple week break so after i qualified in i want to say it was like july 19th i believe uh i took a couple weeks off but then i had to get right back to prep for the olympia um and I thought I did a pretty good job at keeping myself in check, but the weight wasn't coming off. And, um, you know, you just got to suffer a little bit more. Right. So. Right. How about you, Anas? <clears throat> well, uh, the last show was basically uh, the hardest one that I had. And uh, it was just because of running too much stuff, basically. Yeah. And uh, I wasn't mentally prepared for it. It was a little hard. You know, outside of prep, outside of all that thing, uh, family was a little bit uh, having some stuff. And, you know, you know, you be away. You got to be focused 100% to do this. Yeah, if you're yeah. not ready for it, you can't do it. And you got to make those decisions before you even start. But uh, last one was pretty hard because multiple things came in play where the show was pretty far. We had to drive. We couldn't find a, a flight there in time. So even in the drive, we had a, a flat tire and, uh, My gosh, you know, man. you'll be, you'll be almost, you know, no carbs at that time. I had to replace a flat tire in Texas heat. So, uh, we got there finally in uh, San Antonio and, uh, it was a deep show, a lot of big people and, uh, my most difficult thing was basically size wise. I'm always undersized. But between everybody that steps on stage on there, but I mean the the, the size is not <clears throat> everything in this sport. It's it plays a big role, but you know it's a combination of a lot of stuff. You know, sure. size, conditioning, uh, posing, and all that stuff. So, you know, we 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 kept that 
conditioning. We kept that posing. We kept that, you know, uh, spirit of just stepping on stage and doing your thing after you do their hard work. But uh, the last couple of days when I got there, you know, that your body just did not respond to anything. It just got in a shock where, you know, it hold a lot, bunch of water. Um, diet got changed a lot of times past like the last couple of days. So, so I say you're trying to be stress free, not those, let those cortisol levels go bananas <laughs> and you got to change a tire in Texas heat. That's pretty brutal. Yep. It was, uh, it was pretty interesting, interesting show that I did, but you know, we learn and keep going. Yeah. You know, it's always a learning thing. So. Was that, was you also say that that was your best look? Best look was a 2018 when I did the mile high in Denver. Okay. Uh, it was my uh, second pro show. And uh, the first pro show was in Tampa when I met Jeremy there in uh, 2017. Um, that was, uh, no, that was, that was basic. That was 2018, I believe. That was uh, the one that I did there was uh, 2017. At that time you were with uh, Belt. Uh, okay. Clothing. Yeah. So uh, that one was not really planned right. I mean, I finished uh mpc and i got the pro card by winning those five overalls and uh, uh we went straight to pro shows where you have to you know get back and plan on it get some size so you can be compared with people mm -hmm. and uh wasn't didn't do that well and then we just went back to the board and did that plan and shoot for the uh, mile high 2018 june 2018 it was, uh, we, we brought in the best package that I think it was the best, and uh, we scored second to Soraka, which it was an interesting show, too. Like, you know, the, the vibe that you got from the, from the audience, how loud that was. Oh, that's was. cool, yeah. We stood there for a long minute, you know. You know how, you know, you got to mm -hmm. stay tight the whole time on the stage. Yeah. You got to hide your breathing all you want to do is pass out in yeah. those moments all you want to do is just run away that yeah thing. just looking for somebody to stand behind <laughs> <laughs> it was a, it was a pretty inter interesting show there these uh you guys both mentioned um being undersized and feeling like you're undersized at times um these new weight caps right there's new you know weight caps for heights and that's something i think the sport really needed uh that's my personal opinion but what was your guys' first thoughts when you saw that do you want to go first my opinion i'll go my opinion I mean, I, I don't want to say it's fair, and I don't want to say it's not fair, but I would say it's still big for men's physique. Very, in yeah, very big. It's, it's still, yeah, it's still, it's, it's, it's high to be a men's physique with, you know, because short people don't, you know, we don't have that big uh, weight gap that basically tall people got. For example, Steve now, he's, what, 20 pounds you can put an extra just mm -hmm. to go? Uh, I got five pounds extra or seven pounds that I can step on stage. So if I stand by Steve on stage, I'm going to look like a little little guy right next to him. But again, I mean, it can be better. It's, it's, it's a good step towards, you know, getting better. But I think it can be a little uh, more capped to that weight. So, uh, you know, not to put words in your mouth here, Nas, but you're saying, you know, in an ideal world, it would be even smaller weight cap. It would be a less weight cap for the height. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. That's what I would say. I'm I was gonna say, yeah. yeah, it's you know, if you're six, if you're six foot, I want to say that your stage weight can be as high as two thirty, something like that. Two twenty four for me at six one. Okay, two twenty four at six one. You're only six one, dog. That's what they <laughs> measure me at. That is wild. Who else here? I mean, like, I thought nope, you were six I, uh, two, six three. <laughs> we're not even close. To that. Yeah, I mean, I'm five ten, and I'm like, you know, he's like, you know, spitting on the top of my head. I think it depends on the. Uh, height measuring tool that they use because uh, I've been measured in three different heights. And yeah. So. What did your professional soccer card say? I'm uh, I'm over six two. Yes. Yeah. I'll, I'll go with what I'll go with that because so. when they hided me, oh, they took like a whole inch and a half away from me, and I was yeah. like, no, give me that inch and a half back. I'm already short. Like, don't yeah. make me shorter. Yeah. Unreal. I mean, yeah, my, dude. my whole soccer career, I was six two and a half, and then all of a sudden I start doing these shows, and I'm six one, six one and a half. So why do I want to do that? Is that a, is there an advantage to that at all? No, I I, I feel like like I said that there's just something with the measuring system. I think what they need to do is just do it once and that's it. Yeah, yeah. just keep it. You know, how, just no, it how is people's height changing? <laughs> exactly. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, it shouldn't. Kyle, happen. Kyle, you know, as a theory that I slide, I'm sliding down. My feet are getting bigger. I'm just 
Uh, I mean, that's not real, <laughs> but it's like, come on. Why are they going to measure you every time? So 224, for people that understand, like the most, I mean, what is C-Bum on stage for anybody now? 238. Two okay, I, I mean, say like run two forty. You know, yeah, and that's a totally different, totally different class. You know what I mean? He's doing classic physique. It's just wild to think that somebody. I guess those caps could be a lot, a lot more generous. Yeah, for it, your height, what it is it, Jeremy? I think I have twelve pounds to play with, um, <laughs> but it's. I never plan on touching that. Yeah, you know. Yeah, um, I'm kind of with the nos on that. I think that obviously these caps do benefit taller people a lot more. But it's still wild to me because I'm seeing a lot of these guys that are huge. And they're just like, oh, yeah, I still got like 10 pounds to add now. And I'm mm-hmm. what? Yep. <laughs> like it doesn't right. make sense to so me. So men's physique. It was just kind of like a, we, we did this to appease some people, but it doesn't really make any difference. <laughs> I, I Like I said, I think you're going to see these guys getting bigger, the, the majority I, I, of them. I, I don't think people understand how big men's physique has gotten. Yeah. Because at the National Unreal. Show, I just did Unreal. In, in my age group. That, that I was on stage with, I was third tallest. The two guys, there were two guys taller than me, which is mm-hmm. unusual. But then I, uh, I competed in the 40 and over as well. And in the first call out, I was literally the smallest person on stage. I was the shortest and smallest. In physique. In men's physique. <laughs> So, yep. And just for our listeners, guys, I mean, there's going to be, we are going to have some real novice, like don't, they don't follow the sport potentially, whatever. But, you know, when physique started, was it 12? Or was yeah, it, it was 11? 2012 12? time frame, I believe, when they started doing it. And, like and I'll, I'll never forget it. I mentioned, I, I knew a ton of guys who were really, they were right there on becoming pro bodybuilders. They really wanted the bodybuilding, but they were, in quotes, handing out IBB pro cards in 2011 mm-hmm. for, for, for people trying to do physique. And so I was, like, you know, I just basically like didn't lift for a year and just conditioned yeah. myself down. I was doing a bunch of body weight exercises and this and that. And, um, you know, I watched a guy go from on stage 240, go on stage at 200, and he still got second in a local show. And I was just like, dude, can you imagine? Yeah, can you imagine, like, just throwing that whole bodybuilding career down, like, just because you're going to go for the physique card because it was an, apparently an easier path and then didn't even qualify at a local show. And you're just, but it was, a t- it was just a wild time. And so yeah. this is also the era where you know, they were eliminating women's bodybuilding, getting rid of female bodybuilding and then, you know, including physique. It's just um, to see obviously all of the sport to watch it evolve. But I felt like physique was for sure the most eye popping of all the different classes in bodybuilding when it comes to just how much bigger everybody got over the years. Mm-hmm. I mean, bikini looks completely different, right? But not that different, <laughs> yeah. you know, the weight difference is what, like five pounds. <laughs> you know what I mean? But to watch these dudes doing physique, look, um, you know, I was telling you guys, our, we had our, our friend Justin Williams was on the show a couple times, but I went to his first pro show that he did. It was up in Salt Lake City, and I watched him get on stage, and, you know, he's on stage at 200 pounds, and he's, you know, he's really well conditioned, but to, to see him compete with guys that were 20 pounds bigger than him on stage was just like, oh, my gosh, dude. Yeah. And, um, you know, and I feel like the judges, you know, just as this is like a – a novice fan perspective to, to keep that in mind. But I felt like the judges really rewarded the size, you know? And it's like, well, is that not really, it's, I don't feel like that's in the spirit of what we're trying to do here. And, you know? And that's the thing about it though, is at the end of the day, this still is bodybuilding. So it's kind of like hard not to. Sure. Cause I, I feel like, you know, a lot of these judges, their backgrounds are in judging bodybuilding. Sure. Um, now it's just the newer judges that have come up recently that are more versed in, you know, dealing with the bikini and men's physique and things of that sort. But back then, like, I think why Steve was rewarding bigger guys too is he was just used to bodybuilders. So it always, even though I'm a small guy, I had like a lot of muscle. So it always benefited me with Steve. Um, and I loved his judging. And I was telling them on the way here that I was really nervous to get judged by Tyler just because I, had no idea what he was going to think of my look or my physique or and for any people, of that. And for people that you guys are inspiring to become fans of bodybuilding, who is Steve? Who is Tyler? Uh, so Steve Weinberger, he was the head judge for the IFB for the longest time. Um, I believe he's still technically the head judge, at least for the open bodybuilding. Uh, Tyler Mannion is the vice president, yep. I believe, of the MPC IFBB. And he also does a lot more of the head judging now. 
Um, I think he's just kind of getting ready to do the takeover from Steve. But, uh, yeah, they're, they're the guys who pretty much, I mean, their opinions are what you need. So, in, so your last show, your last Olympia was 2020. Yeah. Is that correct? So you've had a couple of years off. We're coming back. What was the, what was the last kind of critique or, you know, mentorship that you got from them that has helped guide you into this year? Um, that, that was an interesting thing. Cause in 2020, I had actually worked my way back up, got fourth. Um, and that was huge for me because getting ready for that one, I felt like I was going to be in like the third call outs. Um, I had no expectations again with this one ended up doing really well. Um, but I was tired of hearing that I was getting too big. But then when I get on stage, you know, like the judges are like, Oh, well, you know, you could fill him out more. He can, you know, eat more, grow a little bit. And I'm just like, damn, you know, so I'm kind Some of serious mixed messaging. Yeah. Yeah. So I got tired of that and I was like, you know what, maybe I should just try to go classic. I mean, hammer out my legs, try took, to go classic. Took out one of my questions right yeah. there. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, in 2021, a new guy, or not a new guy, but a, a competitor named Diogo ended up getting third. And everybody that year was like, dude, if you did the Olympia, you know, that'd be your spot. You know, the reason that he's getting this look is because you're not there. You're not that short guy with that structure. Um, and I was like, all right, well, maybe I should step back onto the men's physique stage. And it's kind of what I'm doing. But, uh, yeah, it's just, it's a lot. <laughs> It's, it's, dude, people don't understand, like, um, just, I, I'm so impressed by all of you guys, but I, I want to say, like, when you are on the highest possible stage and we are accepting the fact that bodybuilding is a subjective sport and, you know, your best that day could be the best you've ever looked and somebody else's, you know, third best they've ever looked somehow wins and, mm-hmm. You know, every, and if, like the quintessential thing, I, mean, I think when you guys get to your level, you don't hear this nearly, may, hopefully nearly as much, but we're like, oh, you got robbed. Everybody, you know, I thought I, mean, I had you first and all this stuff. It's like, dude, I don't want to hear that. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like when you get to your level, people are usually hopefully more savvy and smart not to say stuff like that. But I think we were talking about that on the way over, yeah. the subjectiveness. I mean, you know, all you can do is prepare and be the best that you can be on that day because you really have no idea the judging panel, what, what they're into, what they're looking for on that day. And that, that's the hard part. I mean, you, you can just do what you do and, and then how the cards fall, they're going to fall. So, but it's, it, you know, it's, is it not hard? Is it absolutely hard as hell to not get in your own head about stuff like that at times? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think everybody, especially competitors, I mean, you compete to, Obviously, yeah. y- you want the rewards for what you're putting yourself through, but you're putting everything in the hands of a panel. And like I said, it's subjective as hell. So, you know, you could think, like you, you were saying, you could think you bring your absolute best and you had just won a show before, and then you come back in this one and you're better, but you lose or you lose by a lot. It's just kind of like, I would say it's a little bit of a mind fuck, but to say the least. Yeah. Right. I'm saying like, I. S- and, you know, in a sport where people's, you know, mental health is typically, I think, on you know, in a place that a lot of people don't want to switch spots with people on. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's in a sport where it's like a lot of people, it's coming from a place of insecurity is what they started with, you know, to get into the sport in the first place. And, um, you know, we like we were talking about, I just, I got to give you all kinds of credit because when you get to the highest point, the pinnacle of this sport, you know, we're on the Olympia stage, we're placing top five multiple times. And they tell you something completely ass backwards from what you heard uh, prior. It's so easy to throw in the towel. So like what really truly drives you? Like when are you going to feel Jeremy that you're like, I've, I've done exactly, you know, what I've set out to do here. To be honest, I'm there, you know, uh, I I feel like I've accomplished what I've wanted to within competing. Um, Now my focus is to, you know, obviously I still want to be my best and I'm still going to continue to put forth that effort, but I want to enjoy it a little bit more in the aspect of creating more memories with it, taking pictures, things of that sort. Because every Olympia I've done, I'm focused on the show. I'm not focused on anybody else or anything else. And I've missed out on those experiences. So I feel like for me, I kind of want to take advantage of that, you know, talk to the people that I haven't talked to because it is bodybuilding. It's dangerous. And uh, we've lost a lot of people and you just kind of don't know what will happen. Um, 
and who could be next. So I, I've kind of taken that a little bit more to heart and just want to have fun with it now. It sounds like um, you truly found a way to really love the process. Yeah. You know, and um, it's so hard to, for people when they say like, you know, yeah, man, you know, you got to you know trust the process or start to learn to love the process. And it's like, you have to do it the process for such a long time to truly be grateful for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm psyched that you found that. That's, that's incredible because like I said, it's something that it's just, you just meet 10 more people for every one person that says they've, they've found the joy in being able to stick with it. And even though they've maybe the result didn't be the way they wanted it to be, they're not going to let that control their feelings Yeah, and they're still going to stick with it. And I just, unfortunately we know way more people that, um, they let that result completely change the way they look at the sport. Absolutely. And they, you know, become a victim overnight and all, you know, and two years later you don't see them, you know, in bodybuilding at all, mm -hmm. you know? So I got to give you guys a ton of credit for that. That's probably the, I would say, is that the, I would ask, is that the hardest part about the sport to yeah. put so much energy and effort into something and then have the, the panel tell you complete, maybe something, not only, not only maybe not what your expectations were, but maybe to say something that might even be, um, What's the word I'm looking for here? It'd be like they're giving you uh, feedback that's completely, you know, uh, <laughs> ass backwards from what you heard prior. Yeah, uh, I think it definitely is. That happened to me in, in 18, actually, you know. Um, they said you were too big? Well, no, but what had happened was I was told that I wasn't dry enough. Um, Let's bring up that 18 photo again, yeah. Looking pretty, looking pretty dry. <laughs> it, and, uh, yeah, that's like one of my favorite favorite pictures right there because you could kind of see like the muscles pushing against the skin you know like so i'm filled out uh there's no water <laughs> i mean you <laughs> anyway. have i mean you have veins through your abs yeah so when i was told that i wasn't dry enough or i'd been drier i was a little a little kind of like all right that's that's full of crap but <laughs> <laughs> yeah man like, take it right. i guess yeah you can only you can only uh, take so much of that, I guess. I yeah, I actually didn't even watch that Olympia or the think about that Olympia for, I want to say that, that was in like September. And I think by April was the first time I had actually watched the first call out of that. Like I had never seen it, didn't really care to think about it or anything. And then I watched it and I got pretty upset. I was yeah, like, you'll say that there's only one way that can go. Yeah, I was like, I should have been 10th, but I mean... You know, the guys who still showed up, showed up. They all look great. Um, but I know there was a point in time that was Brandon's first year winning uh, where I was standing next to Brandon, and, you know, I thought we were pretty comparable. Sure. Um, at least in terms of conditioning. So when you hear that feedback, like, oh, you're not dry enough, and I'm looking at it, I'm like, <laughs> but the guy who won, was yeah. drier than him. <laughs> like, Would have loved some feedback on that combo, yeah. uh, the comparison. This was 2020, right, that you had done last the last Olympia, right? Yeah, 2020 Co was the COVID last one. year. So yeah. was this the first year it was in Orlando? Yes. Mm -hmm. What was that kind of like comparatively to, you know, it started like for most people, Olympia is known to be in Vegas. Mm -hmm. This was the first year in Florida. What was the difference But for those for you? Did it I change your approach at all? I like the convenience of how they do things in Orlando because everything is right near the convention center. Um, it's not crowded. It's easy to navigate. Whereas Vegas is a complete shit show. Straight nightmare. Yeah. Straight nightmare. But Vegas is fun in that sense that you get to enjoy the after parties. Uh, so, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think that's a big part of the Olympia culture is to enjoy those after parties and have fun with this, the celebration of everything. So, no doubt. um, you go and take it to Orlando. It's a great venue, great location, but there's not much to do unless you want to go to like universal or Disney or something. You guys ever, you guys have any opinions on that? Well, to, to me, anywhere, it doesn't matter. I mean, you're, you're shooting for a show and we always fly to different shows all over the state. So here or there, but yeah, I get that point where Jeremy said everything's around you because sometimes that can play with your brain. You got and so many needs, man. You got so many needs on well, show day. Yeah. Well, you, you gotta be on point. Yeah. So sometimes when you miss something on your routine that you're used to for three months and all of, all of a sudden it changes, that's going to change a lot. I mean, your, 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 your brain drives your body. And if, if that gets screwed up, your, your body's going to react to it. So, I mean, uh, to me, I mean, the show anywhere, you just got to adapt to it. Just like we adapt to how 
tough the, 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 the diet is and how tough the workouts that we do every day. We wake up early in the morning and all that stuff. So it's a routine. We, we're used to the change. We got to be, we are pros. We got to act like pros. I but love that. I love that, man. Especially, you know, coming from the man that had to change his tire on the way to the show. <laughs> I, I think it's it, adapt and overcome. Yeah. I mean, Sometimes I, it gets hard. I think convenience is important as well. Absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> for shows that we've driven to, um, I mean, I'm, I'm a little OCD to the point where I'll drag a microwave with me. Because I was going to say, it, yeah, I, I know, want, I know I Steve's want, bringing the microwave. Yeah, if I don't have to leave my room because it's convenient, yep. and hence, you know, chasing a microwave and look, and waiting for your food and everything like that, I'll, I'll do that. I mean, yeah. so if I can mitigate the amount of work that I've got to do uh, outside of resting, I will absolutely do it just to make it more conducive to trying to be successful. So, yeah. I, I know I've had conversations with you, Steve, where I, I, I know how much of a real fan of the sport you are. When you reach the highest level of the sport, Jeremy, do you find yourself still being a fan of it year in and year out where you're paying attention to other classes, you're paying attention to other divisions, you're seeing who's ascending, who's falling, this and that? Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm definitely still a fan of it, which makes it kind of weird as a competitor because you know, you're out there critiquing guys that you're fans of. And you're just like, how am I supposed to beat that? When in, in your head, you're just kind of like, damn, I, I like that look. <laughs> right. So uh, I, I definitely still consider myself a fan of the sport. Um, there's still physiques out there where I'm just, you know, uh, it, it's a lot to, to take in. And I'm kind of, kind of do struggle with figuring out like how I'm supposed to compete with that. Totally. So it, it is a little interesting, but can I ask um, this more be more personal? Who comes to mind first and foremost on like, man, how am I supposed to compete with that? Honestly, it's uh, Jeremy Buendia. He, he's been my competition since like day one. Mm-hmm. Um, but to me, he's got such a unique look, and I, I just kind of like it. I, I think it's a good look for the division. I think it's it's. I wouldn't say it's like attainable, but. I don't know. Maybe it's the presentation or the way he, he does it. But to me, I, I've always liked his look and I've always appreciated like his accomplishments. So, Guys, you guys think are ascending in the sport right now that you want to bring up. Who are you excited to see this year? How they What package they bring outside of Jeremy? Obviously, that's the first one that comes to mind. But any other people that you guys are like, man, I saw what this guy put up, you know, maybe in his. Uh, I feel Ryan Terry. Ryan Terry been in this sport for a long, long time. He improved big time, too. And he's looking really good this year. And in my opinion, I mean, he's, as a men's physique, I mean, he, he can fit in that real well. Yeah. And he, sometimes he got underlooked. But, again, I mean, if we want to talk about that, we, we're talking about it now. I mean, when you go to a show, you don't go a show to compete against this person or that person. You go to a show thinking that you're going to be one step better than the last time you step on stage. Sure. So if, if you think you look better, I mean – that's that's the win that you we look forward for. So if if, if that judge tell you, you mean you need to be looking a little tighter or bigger here or bigger there, that's his opinion. It will change from a different person to another. So we we we, we talk we take that feedback from them and we we you know plan on doing stuff like that. We we we, we do our, our thing. We, we we basically look at our own body because we were on. You're you're your best coach and you're your best mentor. So the motivation should be you. And if you want to improve yourself, you got to, you know, just work on yourself and go there. I mean, but to me, the, the best thing that I like about this sport is the challenge. I, I really like the challenge in it. And it's all challenges. It's all like working against yourself and getting strength in your mind, your body and all that stuff. It makes you a better person. Be an example, lead by example to people. You know, uh, the industry right now is going in a, in a way where, unfortunately, we don't like, we don't want, we don't want to see. But uh, our job as, you know, long time been in this is to spread the, the, the right word, the, the, be, be, the, be example to the other people, the new people, show them the right ways, yeah, not show them the easy way. You're a genuine, uh, you know, steward uh, of the sport. You're setting an example for others to follow, of course, like you're saying. And Anas, I just appreciate how much that you take that serious. You take on that responsibility serious. And I'm sure you guys echo the same sentiments. Um it's so, I like you're saying, it's with the, we've talked about this in other episodes with other uh, people within the sport, but it's, it seems troubling in this day and age with social media and how loose um, anabolics are being tossed around on social media 
by people that are, you know, 17, 18 years old. Definitely. Talking yeah. about things like trend. TRT. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah, that I was shocked, honestly, when I went to this uh, Tampa show back in 2018, uh-huh. where I was in a gym working out uh, last couple of days. And it was so easy to the point they walk up to you and they're like, hey, what are you using? Like, hey, what are you running? Blah, blah, blah. And I was like, is it that open now? And all the kids that comes in is 17, 18 years old. And, you know, it's it's, it's going even wider than that. But. Yeah, you you know, it's like the best, you know, oh, my dude. The uh, a perfect example. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I like I like his approach to things. I, I genuinely do. I just think uh, for our listeners, who are we talking about here, Jeremy? Uh, was it Sam Sulik? Yeah. So he he's I mean he's just been blowing up all over social media the last like month, but he's getting a lot of critiques from. You he's know, the guy on the left. And the guy on the right. <laughs> For everybody watching, if you can see this, uh, this is the time to watch us on YouTube. He is the guy on the left, and he is the guy on the right. This is not healthy. Here, he, he, yeah, I, I would I, say I, he's running quite a bit of stuff. I, I think uh, those are not uh, those are not zits, guys, on the front of his chest, right? Yeah, these are pins, right? No, no, no those no, are all that, that's acne. that's actually zits. Yeah. That's acne. You don't see chest acne like that uh, very often. That's a reaction. I think the problem is is people are not educated enough in the compounds that they're utilizing, um, and more is better. Um, you know, oh my even, gosh. even just yeah. even just working with clients and you go through a Q and A and ask them if they're natural or if they're enhanced, then give me the list of what you are using. Um, it, it's extreme uh, to the point where it's like, do you understand what you're doing? You know, it's you you can't put the oven at six hundred and cook a turkey in two hours. There's a process here, and yeah. um, you know if they understood the uh, the chemistry behind the products and and the the origin of what what the drugs were designed for, they would understand that less. It, you it, get more from less, yeah. and the combination of of compounds amplifies them, which means you can use even less again. And it's um, person by person. Yeah, you know, it's like there's a point of diminishing return for every human. Mm-hmm. Um, certain people are built genetically right to where they can handle more um their bodies that god gave them that kind of gift whatever that may be and then you have the best of the best in the sport as far as their um their track records go right i mean uh chad nichols is a friend of ours he is from springfield missouri which is where supplement superstore started and unfortunately you know dallas we lost one of the one could have been one of the best you know could have been one of the greatest ever uh, based on his age and, and his size. And um, you look at like, man, if some of the best of the best are fallen, what makes an 18 year old kid think, you know, you're just like, why would you roll the dice like that? You know, it's just sad. It's that, not, it's not there. It's, part of sport. Just, it's not there. What we just looked at. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's social media. That is hyping something that is never been easier to compare yourself. Yeah. You know, and, um, um, you know, I tell people all the time that that magazine look is not sustainable. You know, that is that is not real life. The body needs a certain amount of fat. The body needs a certain amount of 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 time to you know recover. Uh, that that abbed look year round doesn't exist. You know, that's that's a fallacy. And these kids want that look, and it's it's they're they haven't been educated enough to understand that. Yeah, I, I, I felt like we saw you know like you know with Ziz you know dying you think i feel like that kid was just ziz yeah. you know a few years younger you know what i mean like ziz was just like yeah i just like to party i just want to look good he started the aesthetic movement if you will and like it cost him his life and it's like people are still like see that's i mean that's pointing like, to him as like their inspiration that's exactly yeah. so that's 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 just another proof saying that you know the industry right now is 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 always looking about uh i want to look at like i want to look like this guy what is he running? They start running like him. What is he eating? I want to eat like him. Every person is different than the other. This might work with you. This might not work with you. So, you know, that's why I always say compete against yourself. Study your body. Study the stuff that you take. Read about him. See side effects, all that stuff. Because you might not have those side effects. You might not work with you that way that work with this person. You might look better with doing something else, you know? Like, it's not always the same. To yeah, pay everybody. now or pay later, right? Because it's like even, let's say we go down this path, right? Let's unpack this a little bit more. We're young guys. We're all, we all started, you know, falling in love with fitness at a different age. 
And let's say you do compare yourself fully to one person and say, I'm going to take all the same gear as them. I'm going to live the same way. I'm going to eat the same way, et cetera. Well, then all you do is, you know, you're mastering how to look like somebody else. Mm-hmm. You know, eventually there's going to be an end road, right? There's going to be some kind of a finish line with that where there, let's say you do obtain that look. Now what? Right? Like, who are you at this point? Right? So you got to do it for yourself at some point, right? Absolutely. Same time, I mean, I would ask this question. Have you ever seen somebody look exactly the same as the other person? Like they're looking at or something like that. Like, I want to look like Jer- Jeremy. Is it possible to look like Jeremy? You know, everybody is different. I mean, we're all, we're, we're all different people, different, you know, your body reacts with different stuff, different ways. It's amazing, man. I mean, we can go, that's a, it's a tunnel. We can go all the way down. I mean, my uh, fiance, she works at a plastic surgeon's office and she has people who are 300 pounds that walk in with a picture of Kim Kardashian and be like, I don't care what it costs. Yep. I want to be like her. Make me look like this. <laughs> and they have to have these like really hard conversations with people. Like, I want you to know that there's just absolutely zero we could give you that would make you look like this. Mm-hmm. Like, that's just not how this works. Well, people want that. Uh, I call it the matrix effect. It's like, well, give me a choice. I want the red pill or the blue pill to get me there. You know, um, they don't. They don't want to know how much time Jeremy spent in the gym or how. Much oh time yeah, Nelson don't ever, don't gym. ever bring yeah. up the hard work. Or, or, or you know, how many? <laughs> it always just comes down to steroids. Yeah, or how, <laughs> how or, you know, the the sleepless nights are where you're starving yourself and and you can't sleep. It's not because of the drugs. It's because you have no carbs in your body and carbs are causing insomnia because you haven't had any that day. You know, and stuff yeah. like that. So um, I want to. We can, like I said, we could talk on that part of the time but i think there's no real end game it's just like man we got to keep being the example yeah. right like you're saying start you know you know like in your own gym i guess try to continue to spread that positive message so i appreciate that you guys take that responsibility serious because whether you wanted to or not you are inspiring so many with your actions every day um let's flip it over to the business side of things uh with bodybuilding because we've seen in the last, you know, it's, it's cool that you've been doing this at such a, you know, for such a long period of time at a high level, Jeremy, because we've seen in our careers, me and Kyle, we started working in the fitness industry in 2008. And so we were still around like, you know, so MySpace was the only thing going, yeah. you know, MySpace and Facebook. And, uh, do you guys know Micah Lassert at all? He's I, a fitness model. Mm-hmm. Um, say, say that again. His name is Micah Lassert. Micah Lassert. It's fit. Hitch Fit or Mr. Hitch Fit on Instagram. Okay. AJ Ellison. I, I might have. Okay. He's just a really, really, really cool guy. He's got a great episode we had with him recently. I'd, I'd recommend you listen to just because he's a guy that was blowing up and on MySpace and he was gaining a lot of traction and a lot of his fitness was built through MySpace okay. and he was a fitness model. He was on a ton of different covers and he was in like a, you know, a uh, reality show. But it's like, you know, he's been done with doing, you know, pro level shows for a long, long time. But that kind of that transition era where it's like we only knew of the best of the best bodybuilders. I feel like around 2008, Mm -hmm. around 2000, et cetera. I mean, obviously from like the 19, you know, from the start of bodybuilding to then. And then all of a sudden I felt like the, for me shreds was the first brand to take bodybuilding and say, we don't care if you got fourth in your local show. Like we don't care if you could only get second and your local show, and you've never competed on a big stage. You're good enough to look like a fitness model for us, and we're going to sell a lot of product through social media on this. And it changed, I felt like, how the sport was looked at. I oh, mean, it changed the, the fitness industry as a whole. Agreed. Now you didn't have to be a bodybuilder. You could just be somebody who looks good, and mm-hmm. now you're making money, and you're making more money than you know guys like Ronnie Coleman and Jay Cutler. And Unreal. Like, an unreal. I mean, there was just like a, a a wild west kind of gold rush effect to every one of these things, right? When something just you turn on this new faucet, and it's like everybody's trying to race to see you know how much they can get out of it before it gets turned off by something, you mm-hmm. know. And uh, I think that point was uh, was Photoshop. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, th- I think yeah. what's funny about that is is a lot of these people are getting called out now because of the goon light in the gym and the filters and everything yeah. like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And to the point where they're what's they're, the light in the gym? Sorry, the, the goon. Light. There's a goon light. <laughs> Teach me this. That is that is the best opportunity to take a photo in any gym. You've just got to find the goon spot, right? That is true. I know. Every gym has that spot. You just got to find it. <clears throat> gotcha. Okay. But but these people, like if you look, there's been some classic physique guys that have been called out, and they've they've 
okay, they've stepped on stage thinking they're the business, and what's happened is is it's like, woof, they've fallen flat on their face because what they've presented in social media hasn't showed up on stage. Well, what a, I mean, what a failing, you know, <laughs> obviously we all know, like, if anybody has any sense, you're going to get exposed if you yep. put yourself on a position to get exposed. Yep. Right? I mean, like, um, you know, it's like if Jake Paul didn't actually train at boxing, he's going to get his ass kicked, yep. you know, but he actually trained so he can talk that shit. But it's like for these people to be doctoring their waists, like, well, we see your blocky ass hips in person, man. What are we going to do here? Well, that's also the problem with social media. And, and yeah. you know, once you start bodybuilding, you already have some sort of body dysmorphia. Sure. And you amplify that because you're continuously comparing yourself with everybody out there and every other person you're competing with. So if you have an opportunity to, you are like, oh, well, you know what, let me bring my waist in a little bit or make my quad sleep a little bit bigger. I mean, that's, I'm assuming that's what the thought process is. And it's, it's just wild to me how unhealthy that is because you're just right. consistently, I mean, you're literally just breaking yourself down by doing that. I wonder, yeah, I wonder, um, you know, I bet you they, you know, you think it's possible they just truly believe that, like, by the time it's show day, they are going to look like the doctored photo? Do you think in their head they're thinking, like, I just got to do a little bit more of this and a little bit more of that and a little bit more training and I'm going to... Well, they're just. I, I, I think it just comes down to the views that they're going to get on their pictures. Sure. I think that's all it comes down views to. Because you'll have, comp- you'll have competitors who are posting their stage shots and they're altering their stage shots. And I'm just like, what's the point, man? Like, right. your actual stage shots are up there. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It's just wild. Uh, the whole Photoshop thing, though, like, I kind of owe most of my career to that. Just because I think around the time when, like, Devin was getting called out for his photo. I was going to say, you guys are similar. Well, in, the they, sense, in the sense of, like, stature, yeah. weight, what he was trying to portray himself to look like was just you in real life. Well, it was basically, like, he was getting called out for Photoshop. And then another guy did a YouTube video on me and was like, here's a guy who doesn't have to Photoshop. And it was... Kind of took everything off for me. I was Thank like, you, guy from YouTube. Yeah, I was like, hey, yeah. Yeah. Well, let's go YouTube. Yeah. yeah. So. It's nice whenever, like, the, you know, the internet helps you out. You know what <laughs> I, I mean? I think I went from, like, well, I want to say it was around 30,000 followers at that time. After that video, I think I shot up to, like, 100,000. Damn. And I was just like, holy crap. And this was back in, like, 20, 2015, 2016. We're just so. like, no one had 100,000, period. Uh, yeah. You we're know, like, you, you know, you it. get up to that. It's a it's pretty big deal. So, Were you... um? So were you using fitness as your main career at this point? Yes. How long have you been, uh, has fitness been your career? Uh, full time since six, 2016. Okay. Yeah. Um, even now. So do we still train clients? Are we, I, I do train online. Um, but most of it is just everything I've been doing through endorsements and things of that sort. Uh-huh. I want to talk about a few of them you've mm-hmm. had. You've been with Dark Sport for a long time? Yes. So I signed up with Dark Sport originally back in 2015. Um, and I did leave them after my 2016 Olympia. I had somebody in my ear that was just telling me how much better things could be. Oh, yeah. And, you know, first, so. first year doing the Olympia as well. So, exactly. Yeah. It's like all you're thinking about is like, wait, so I can make more? I can do more? And uh, I ended up going to that company. Um but yeah, I ended up signing back up with Dark Sport because I felt like that was my biggest regret was leaving them. Um, and I was just grateful that they gave me an on, another opportunity to That's kind of awesome, be a man. good athlete. Not to mention, you know, they were with you since the beginning, right? Yeah. So you always feel, always feels good to come back to those people. Oh, absolutely. You've been like, but some, so this is, this is more of our wheelhouse as far as what we know. We've got Axe and Sledge, mm-hmm. EHP Labs, mm-hmm. HD Muscle, and now Rule One. Yes. Out of those, you know, we're not going to make you pick any favorites or anything here, but it's just like, what were the differences between how these were all run? Because I know some of these brands personally, they're run very different. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I wasn't around a lot of the back end of those. You know, I saw more of like how Axe and Sledge did things, and I really, really like how they do it. You know, they have that blue collar approach to everything. They stand by everything that they say. Um, with EHP... Uh, same thing, you know, you, you knew the owner was very, like he, he took the formulas to heart. I think he was very, um, I remember him saying something about like, you know, some, maybe a daughter or somebody in his family was sick or maybe he was, and that's why he took things seriously in terms of what you're putting in your body. Um, and yeah, um, 
in terms of how they're run, it's just, I guess it kind of just depends on the scale, you know? And I would say not just how they're run, Jeremy, but how they, how they run their athletes, right? Okay. How, how is the relationship with their athletes? How much are they pouring into their athletes on a personal level versus how much is it at, how many people are clicking your link? Um, I, I, f- it's a good like, question. Yeah, yeah, I, I kind of feel like some of the companies could have done a little bit better. Um, I'm not going to lie. You know, I, I, I can't say anything bad about any of them because I have great relationships. I don't burn bridges. They're all good people. Um, it, this is more of a professional critique than it is a personal critique, yeah, right? I, I think it's just, you know, these companies are looking at you and they're paying you. But it, it I feel like it needs to be a mutual partnership. You know, it goes both ways. So if you're doing something and the company's not helping you with any of that, then nothing's going to happen. Yeah, it's um, not really a partnership. In that, it, it's in that not instance. a partnership. It's just like, all right, well, how much can I make for you? Um, Which is ironic because I would say that by and large, I one, I appreciate that you have that mentality looking at partnering with a brand because um, when people are first breaking into the sport, um, God love anybody who's getting started because of how expensive the sport can be. Mm-hmm. Yep. And, um, you know, and no one's doing fitness for a living at the time. And it's just very, very difficult to make ends meet at times as a bodybuilder. Yep. And they're always looking for that, you know, what's in it for me, leg up situation. And, and it's not everybody, but it's by and large what yeah. we see. You know, we have people who are competing in a local show and they're like, how do I get sponsored? And you're like, bro, do you go into the grocery store and ask him this? I'm like, I see you buying those eggs and chicken breasts. Like, are you like sitting down with the manager over at Hy-Vee at the grocery store and being like, hey, bro, like buy a lot of chicken from you. <laughs> like, you know, up. that's what I mean. I'm just like, dude, I am not the brand owner of any of these brands. I'm just a local supplement guy. I'm no different than the grocery store. Yeah. Like, I didn't make any of this shit myself. So, like, when people ask you that, it's, it's mind blowing to me. But we have a bunch of brands. We have a lot of stores. When we first moved here, Jeremy. We had like six or seven other brands, other stores mm-hmm. that were in business. And, um, you know, they all did do local sponsored athletes and they're not in business anymore. And I'm like, well, yeah, it's hard I, to do. That, that, that's it, something that I've learned a lot about, too, is a lot of these companies will find some sort of success um, with their athletes. And then they'll pull that because they feel like they don't need the athletes anymore to make money. And that's when they start crashing. Because at the end of the day people are relating to the athletes. Um, maybe that's you're, you're providing the inspiration to be very clear. Yeah. So the athletes are the ones providing the inspiration for, for everybody. And like you are the most influential yeah. in the room when it comes to it. So I, I think it's interesting. I've seen some companies where they are just like, well, you know what? I don't feel like I need to pay you anymore. And that company crashes and burns and you know, it's unfortunate. Um, I feel like a lot of people let their egos get in the way of some stuff like that. So, with uh, with Rule One Protein, what have you liked about them being with them so far? Uh, Been around micro, a long time. Yeah, I'm not micromanaged. I love that. So I, I like that I can just do my my job, what I'm supposed to do, um, as long as I'm doing it to the best of my abilities, you know. And they see that. I think that's what matters. Because you know, I don't consider myself a salesman or anything like that. You know, I'm somebody who got on social media because my sister told me I should. You know, I, I had no other purpose. I wasn't trying to make it anything. I wasn't trying to get anywhere with it. Um, it just happened to take off for me. So in today's day and age, it's gotten complicated because you take somebody like me, I'm a very introverted guy. I don't like putting my stuff out there. I don't like trying to sell or convince people what they need to take. I'm like, hey, guys, this is what I use. This is why I enjoy it. You know, if you want to try it out, try it out. Like I said, I'm not a, I'm not a sales guy. Not here to be pushy. Yeah. Yeah. For me, it's it, which makes it hard because you have to be on on social media now. You have to be a salesperson. Um, So I've kind of been relying on who I am in terms of like drawing people versus being so focused on the sales. Like, I'll let people know, like, hey, like, I'm not going to be your hottest seller. Like, that's not who I am. But, you know, I could bring some attention to the company, you know. It won't be a lot, but it'll be something. So the micromanaging sounds like just some a lot of coaching on your social media presence and how you should do it and this and that. Um, kind of. Well, with that, like rule one, I like it because there's like, all right, here's the post you got to do each month or however many it is. Um, just you know, you can't do it to where it's just like an article of clothing or something like that. 
Um, don't try to be spammy, you know, just be organic with it. Don't throw like a container right on the counter. Exactly. Like, (laughs) use it. (laughs) Could you look into that camera and say protein breath podcast? (laughs) (laughs) But, uh, yeah, it's just an interesting time. Cause like I said, I, unfortunately now I have to be a sales guy and I'm not the best. So, yeah, man. Um, we try to tell people that we're associated with, um, you know, it's unfortunate when you have to look at it like that too, like you were saying, and it's like, Hey, if you do feel like these products help you, then we are just helping the people that are using them. Right. right. So as long as we're just phrasing it in the right ways in the sense of like, Hey, this is what I use to help myself do this. If you're looking for that help, I would recommend it because yeah. it works, you know, um, and try to leave it at that. But man, when it gets into like the, the mud of, uh, you know, like you're not driving enough of this for it to, you know, and it's like, yeah. well, why did you go into the ex- with that expectation? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, yeah, we're not, you didn't come at me because of my sales abilities, right? Like yeah. you came at me because of my physique, right? Yeah. That's what I try to tell people is like, I, I've been, I remember when I first uh, talked with Axis Ledge, you know, my thing was like, look guys, I'm not a, I'm not a big seller. <laughs> like that's just not who I am. I'm a guy who happened to like bodybuilding and my page took off. So, you know, kind of, you're, you're kind of getting me for who I am, not what I can possibly do. I Bring guess you. you. Yeah. Right, dude. Um, as far as you get where you guys live in Nas, Jeremy, you guys are both in Texas. Uh, I'm in South Sorry. Carolina. Okay. Is that where you're fully full time? South Carolina? Now, yes. But you spent some time in Texas prior. Yes, it is. Is that right? Um, you also served in the military. We haven't mm-hmm. talked about that at all. One, thank you for your service. Oh, pleasure. Um, we're huge on back in military at Supplement Superstore. Um, but you know, when did you decide I'm going to go full time out? Cause your dad was also somebody who served in the military. Right. Yep. And that was his full time career. Yes. And so for yourself, you had to make the, I'm not going to do the same path. Was that a tough decision or was it really understood? No, it was, uh, it was pretty simple. Like I knew I'd wanted to serve my country. That, that was a big thing for me ever since. I mean, I can remember my dad deployed when I was in seventh grade. So like, what I, an impressionable age very, too. Yeah. So I like, I remember that very clearly. Um, and that was just something that I always wanted to do. Like I wanted to give back my whole thing. And even till now, it's just always my purpose is to, to serve or give back. You know, um, I've always wanted to be still involved with law enforcement. It's just taking that pay cut from this to law enforcement. would probably be a little bit harder than I could do right now. But, um, yeah, I mean, military family, you know, I, I did my time and, I love how humble you are, man. That's great. I mean, like, dude, you dedicated years of your life to serve your country. And you're just like, yeah, man, just, you know. <laughs> well, I'll tell you this. Um, I had a friend who spent six years in reserves, mm-hmm. and he was had his biggest regret was that he didn't just do full uh, full enlistment right off the bat. I'm kind of feeling that way. That That's where it was. That's why I was like, I'm forgetting <laughs> to answer something. But, uh, yeah, I, I think when I had gotten back from the deployment, I was given an opportunity to basically get ready from another deployment to Afghanistan. First one, Iraq. First one was Iraq. Okay. So I did Iraq from 2009 to 2010, did the full year. Um, my unit got back and then we had gotten orders to go to Afghanistan in about another year. Um, and at that time, my contract would have been coming up as well. So they were like, either you can get out a little early or you can re-enlist and go to Afghanistan. It would have been four or six more years. Yeah, if I re-enlisted, I probably would have done like probably another five or something. At that point, if I made that decision to re-enlist, it would have been because I was going to make it a 20-year a thing. Right, career. Yeah. Um, however, I was at that point where I just kind of wanted to see what else was out there for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's why I decided to get out and um, ultimately led me down this path. So. Um. Let's see here. Other famous bodybuilders such as Sean Roden, Terrence Ruffian, and Logan Franklin. What do you think the military and bodybuilding have in common to have such high level guys be in similar corners? Discipline. I think that's the biggest thing is the discipline and the, uh, I like to say embrace the suck it is a big military thing. That's yeah. all it is. <laughs> so I feel like if you can go through that or a deployment or something like that, this stuff is pretty freaking easy yeah um but at the same time man (laughs) i i eat my own words because some of these preps have been brutal so i would love to ask you this question because your dad was you said he did the 20 yeah right 
when you talked about your deployments mm-hmm. with him, can you give us a story that does anything stick out to you about comparing just your time in the military convert versus his and what's changed? Well, actually, um, so the reason why my dad's first deployment to the Middle East stuck out to me um, was because I didn't understand it at the time. You know, I knew he, after 9-11 happened, he re-enlisted. He wanted to go and do the, the patriotic thing. Um, so I didn't get it. I didn't really understand it at the time. I was too young. Um, and I remember him telling me in the morning, he's like, hey, you know, I just want to walk you out to the bus stop, say bye or whatever. Um, I forgot he was leaving that day. <laughs> that, uh, that still sits with me because I feel horrible about that. Like my dad, he is a very manly man, like not sentimental, not emotional whatsoever. Um, so that definitely like stuck with me. We actually ended up going on deployment at the same time. So when I went to Iraq, he went to Afghanistan. So uh, my my family, my sisters, my mom, they were not having a good time. You know, you got my dad in one place, me in another, and we're both going through our fair share of, of crap. So, oh, man, what a time. Yeah. That's unreal. Um, I can only imagine that. And, like, uh, this is, you know, when you're going out to the bus stop. It's like you just don't know what you don't know, man. It's so crazy to think back about, like, what you cared about in those moments. Yeah. You like, I mean? completely forgot that he was leaving for a year. Yeah, I was like, this is weird. You're like, and you're like, I'm close to my dad. I love my dad. Yeah. Just, like, that's how that went. I was just like, bye, dad. You know, and then when I got back home and realized that he was gone for the year, I was like, oh, man, <laughs> I'm like, screw that one up. Did he, was he able to come back at all sooner? No. no he full did year. His, yeah, he did his, or I can't remember if it was a full year. Um, my dad was special forces. Um, I think they did shorter deployments. Right. But I, I can't remember if it was, if he did the full year or if he came back after like three or six months or something. But, well, man, um, we're so excited for you for this, for this Olympia. I want to ask you guys if you could go back to like your little, like just the, the smallest boy version of yourselves when you first fell in love with bodybuilding, you know, when it was just all that unknown, all that, all that blissful ignorance of bodybuilding, you know what I'm saying? Oh man. <laughs> well done, Luke. Um, who is the bodybuilder that you wish you could have a conversation with? I want, I want to say probably Arnold just to, to understand his mindset. I, I think, you know, I've, I've had the opportunity to meet a few of the guys I've looked up to um, and had conversations with him. But I, I feel like Arnold was just so ahead of his time and loved the mind games. And I would just you know, love to understand he was so confident, too. It was just an interesting guy, it seemed like, all around. Absolutely, man. The Muhammad Ali of the sport, yeah. without a doubt. Um, just way ahead of their time transcendent to say the least Mm -hmm. how about you and us Mm. i would say jake cutler he's a i've always heard good things about him and he's always keep it real uh didn't have the chance to meet him but i mean i always hear good things about him i met a couple other like ronnie coleman and all that stuff but uh i feel like what sets jay yeah what sets jay apart from ronnie to you uh, humbleness. Yeah, yeah. I'm always because you know I'm I'm a strong believer of you know bodybuilding. Uh, just like I always say, you got to lead by example, and uh, you know you get the pro card or you get to a certain stage in this uh, industry, uh, you got to pay attention. That there's a lot of people watching you, even if there's if you think there's nobody watching you, there's a lot of people watching you. And just like nowadays, I mean, everything is social media. They're gonna look at everything you do, and they're gonna follow it. So. Uh, be that leader and let them follow the good things. So, you know, you, you learn something, you, you learn from your st- mistakes, spread it around, tell them that, you know, be aware, like aware, uh, s- send awareness to the people that's following you. Yeah, uh, you're always watched, you know, like sure. no matter what you do, people are going to look at you and do what you see what you're doing. So always be that example, that good example of, a real bodybuilder because bodybuilding is not only about how your body is looked or something like that. It's about how a person as, as a person basically. So, uh, it's all a, a full package together. You can't separate those two together because you might look good, which a lot of us does look good, 
but does that equal uh, how you basically, uh, your personality, like this? Yeah, how you carry something. yourself outside of bodybuilding, I think, goes a long way with you. A lot of people, yeah, loses that, unfortunately, in making, you know, the industry nowadays how it is. Uh, Jay's yeah. still trying to sell some stuff. Everybody still sells some, some stuff. Up, all I was just going to say is that, like, he's not impossible to get a hold of is all I'm getting at. And so yep. if you we find know. yourself, you know, at another, you know, at another show, uh, I've heard nothing but great things about Jay Keller. Correct. And um, I heard he's extremely approachable. Correct. And uh, that'd be cool. That'd be very cool. So I hope you do get to meet him someday. That's Hopefully. exciting. Yep. <laughs> Steve, who sticks out to you, man? Um, what, would a, what would an Australian soccer player, who would he want to, who would he want to meet? Well, I'd probably have to go with Arnold as well. Um, you know, for me, his unwavering belief in himself, even when he was young, uh, is just undeniable. I mean, I, I don't think there's been, not that I know if I could be wrong, uh, another athlete that just had that level of belief that carried it through to success in, in everything that they've done. Um, you know, f- for me, and, and you've heard this before, the, the whole motivation for me to start playing soccer was watching soccer on TV at five and g- going, oh, my God, look at all those fans going bananas for these people. That's what I want to do, you know, and, and, and then just, okay, modeling myself on the fact that I, I needed to be the best at everything that I've, I've ever done. And, you know, obviously you fail at some things and you're successful, but his mindset was I'm going to be the best at everything. And he, he, he was, <laughs> I mean, tell me something that he's failed at. <laughs> yeah. That's right. True. Yeah, man. Uh, his marriage. That's about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be back. And even that, even then, I and even then I think he's the one that decided that he was going to walk away. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, set me up on a tee for that. <laughs> that. That was pretty damn good. Well, there's a hilarious, yeah. you guys know Bill Burr at all? He's a yeah. stand-up comedian. He has one of the best ever. If you've looked up, look up Tiger Woods and Arnold, um, just YouTube that one. But he talks about just like all these great men are falling. <laughs> you know, they're getting caught doing dumb uh, things. He's like, back in the day, no one would have known. Nope. He's like, Arnold, and he's like, I mean, he has, I mean, just watch it. But he just goes through all of the things that Arnold did. He's like, he's like, he's not done yet. He married a Kennedy. He's not done yet. He becomes a governor. He's not. And he's like, he's like banging my, my maid on a, on my own bed at my own house. He's like, that's a layup. He's like, I've been hitting nothing but net for 40 years. Oh man! And he's like, gets caught with something like that. He's like, all these great men are falling over stupid stuff. It's true. I know. Right. right <laughs> but true. just definitely worth a watch. Anyway, the one I want to say that I think would be so awesome because of course Arnold is the most transcendent athlete with, you know what I mean? He created the, the, the what we know it is today. I feel like, and uh, I'm so happy that they brought back classic physique because uh, it really honors his physique. I think best. Right. Mm. But, um, I was talking about this uh, with a buddy the other day and I think that it would just be super interesting. There's a million different streaming services and everybody's trying to do their own documentary and their own this or that. But man, how cool would it be if there was a, like a 30 for 30, or, uh, you know, that style documentary of Lou Ferrigno having to lose to Arnold and what he was, go- what he was going through and how he thought, f- thought of Arnold. And I would love to hear it from, like, a modern-day perspective because he just, and the time he was in his own feelings the whole time, and mm-hmm. it's like now when you can just see how great he ended up being, how he was, he was a part of that story, and he was the villain in some capacity. But, like, how awesome would it be for, like, some of the greatest athletes of all time and the people that they beat it's like how how cool is it for someone who you know let's say lost to michael jordan in, a, in an nba finals and be like yeah i go in against him in that game and that was the hardest thing i'd ever had to do you yeah. know like i've never seen a player be so good you know i love to hear people talk about the greatest of all times but like i got beat and like that'd be the name of the documentary uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that honestly that sounds how, pretty awesome yeah i would love to hear like just like were they as amazing as we thought they were and they're like yeah like I'm just psyched that I get to say that I was in that game. <laughs> you know got, what I mean? I got beat. Right? Anywho, um, the, the quintessential question for any bodybuilder is what are we eating post-show? So I won't do that to you. <laughs> I won't do it. But I would like to ask, when you do get to cheat, when you want to have something that you want that's a treat for you, whether it be off-season, post-show, it doesn't matter, just what comes to mind for the foods where you're like, I actually think that that's... You know, I'm not thinking about discipline in this moment. I just think it's awesome. That's pizza. Easily always pizza for me. I I went through like a phase um, where 
I mean, I was eating probably like three pizzas a week. Yeah, uh, let's go. Yeah, I was, you're just tipping the scales at 180, 190. Well, that that was that was post show enjoying pizzas. I'm with you. Okay. There was actually a time when I was with uh, AJ Sims where I was doing a pizza after every workout. God bless. Yeah. <laughs> was it was, you, like, it was you, awesome. Uh, is this is this Texas pizza? Is this Carolina? This, this pizza? is just Little Caesars. Okay, you know? respect yeah, every day. Five dollars. <laughs> yeah, go get your large pizza and eat that. And that was a good life. I can't yeah, do that anymore. I, so I had this exact conversation with Kyle this morning and I was like, dude, pizza is like Mac and cheese. It's like, even if it sucks, it's pretty good. Yeah. And he's like, that's so not true when it comes to pizza. And I'm like, it's hundred percent true when it comes to pizza. What are your guys' thoughts on this? Is that most, is that, is that, is it not true that like 99% of pizza you eat is absolutely good? Yeah. Oh, oh, I, I, I think the important thing that we've got to understand here is have you ever seen a food that when you eat it the next day, it's potentially better. There you go. Yeah, now we're getting into a whole yeah, other level right, here. Right. I'm just saying, <laughs> no, let's just throw that out there. And the air fryer has really changed the game on next day pizza <laughs> because now has. you can you can crisp it up again. No one's ever enjoyed a microwave slice of pizza. <laughs> Never tried that. Soggy crust. Oh, we've all tried it. Don't lie, Nas. No, I didn't try it. You've <laughs> no, tried it? Not. Never? Nope. You never microwaved a slice of pizza in your life? Microwave, not air fried. Oh, well, there, yeah. Now, see, now the game's changed. Yeah, I don't have the patience for an air fryer. Well, air fryer is like the same as a microwave. Just put it in there for like 60 seconds, and it's like crisp again. As my wife always tries to tell me to use the air fryer. I'm just like, I don't have 60 seconds. You, know, like you are 25 a, seconds. You are an <laughs> Olympia-level bodybuilder who doesn't use an air fryer? No, I have an air fryer, but I'm saying if I want to eat pizza, I'm going to eat it. Yeah. Sooner than the 60 seconds. or Yeah, yeah. There's no, there's Every no. pizza is a personal pizza, yeah. right? You just got to believe. There's no reheating <laughs> here. You just yeah. open the fridge and you go. Yeah, man. I love it. I appreciate your time today, guys. It's a it's a Friday night. You know, we've probably got plans, but I really appreciate you guys taking the time to be on here today. Um, extremely stoked to see how you do here, and we'll be following along. I well, appreciate it. Thank appreciate you for having you us. Having us here. Absolutely, man. You guys have a great one. Always a pleasure. Signing off.